now I speak into the universe. And <laughs> where is Nick? I don't even have this. I'm here. Oh, good, good. <laughs> so this is the man I want to introduce. And you might have already read, he's a psychologist and he is a practitioner. He developed a founder of Open Dialogue UK and then he established so many trainings uh, out of Western Loveland, traveling through the world. And I just want to add, he is an incredible person and he is, I wrote down some uh, words <laughs> and the list was too long, but which is still in my brain is he's a multi-talent. He is, um, uh, he's an, in, uh, in, uh, he's a website and, uh, and, um, designer and he is a bartender. He is a, uh, he's a DJ. I always all witness this. He's obsessive compulsive with open dialogue and, and he's a friend and he survived a battle with me, which is incredible. It's not easy. And, uh, so now I'm happy to to give you the stage. And this book was, was an, a fabulous and very uh, uh, extreme uh, sucking work for him and for Brian Martindale. And, and so now it's here and he gave birth to it. So let's hear what's the content. Thank you very much, Volkmar, and uh, uh, for your kind words. And um, yes, I think I recognize myself and our story together in these words and it's good to see you and to have you here so um yeah i'm tasked with introducing um a new book on open dialogue and psychosis it's been probably about four years in the making um take a much longer <clears throat> than i might have imagined it would take it's one of those things if, if you know everything that's involved at the start you will probably um kindly say no thank you but um, uh, I, I, I didn't do that. You know, I was interested in the idea of the project. And yeah, four, four years down the line, um, we have a publishing date. It's due to be published by Routledge on the 30th of July. And it's going to be part of the ISPS book series. Some of you may well be familiar with this series. It has a, a variety of, of titles. Uh, different um, approaches to working with people uh, with psychotic experience, including um, accounts of lived experience and uh, contributions jointly written um, by service users and, and professionals. Um, it's edited by myself. That's why I'm here uh, talking with you and Brian Martindale, who used to be the chair of ISPS, and it was his idea initially to 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 work on the book. The book ended up containing 47 chapters written by 77 authors in 11 countries. So perhaps um, it starts to become apparent about why it's taken as long as it's taken um, to get it together. It's something that I've done, I suppose, in my spare time. And so there are times when I've had lots of energy to work on the book and times when not so much energy, um, but I'm very glad that, that, that we have arrived. And I thought I'd start by saying something about the process of, of putting the book together. So our, our aim from a very early stage was to make it a polyphonic book with a broad focus. We wanted to include many voices from different countries and hope that the book could serve as a comprehensive introduction to the open dialogue <laughs> approach. And we have two great books um, written by Jakob Sekula um, on the open dialogue approach. Um, in collaboration with Tom Eric Arnkill, and we wanted to create something rather different to complement these books. So the first step was to send out messages to mailing lists of people who are connected to Open Dialogue um, to explain our purpose and invite proposals for the book. In the end, we had over 60 submissions and needed to take time to assess the strength of each proposal and consider how they might fit into the book we had envisioned. And in addition to this, we also contacted specific people who we thought would be well placed to write about specific aspects of the approach. 
And from this process, the shape of a book started to form into sections. And we were then able to send out invitations to many of those who had offered to write chapters. We invited people based on the strength of their proposal and also their level of open dialogue training and experience. And of the chapters which were ultimately submitted from the people that we invited, um, all but a few were accepted for inclusion. <laughs> Due to word count restrictions from the publisher and our desire to have a broad focus, a lot of work had to go into editing the chapters in order to accommodate everyone who we wanted to include. And in this editorial process, you know, our aim was to maximize the polyphony whilst preserving depth. Many of the authors were not writing in their first language, and so it was especially important to pay careful attention to language and meaning. And following a lengthy editorial process with my co-editor, Brian Martindale, there were two rounds of editing with the series editors, Anna Lavis and Andrew Shepherd. So they're series editors for this ISPS series. In this process, it was decided that the co-editors should write an introduction to each section in the book to help to tie the, the book and the themes together. Because we've got you know, quite a lot of chapters, some of which are short, some of which are longer, we felt that it was a need to have this, this, this editor's introduction. And finally, given that most of the contributors were practicing open dialogue and were largely enthusiastic about the approach, it was important to provide a balanced perspective by encouraging them to address challenges and limitations that they had encountered in their work. So that's something on the process. And as a result of this process, this is what we ended up with. So the book is clearly divided into six different sections, which I think cover sort of most aspects of the approach. Introducing Open Dialogue, Section 1, Section 2, a variety of accounts written um, from a, a personal perspective, from people with, with their own lived experience who are in re receiving services, family members and professionals. A section on training. Uh, a section on how open dialogue is being developed in different contracts in different countries. A section on um, comparing open dialogue to, to, to other approaches, related approaches, different approaches, and then finally a section on research. And I'm going to go through these one at a time now. So here we have section one. Um, just three chapters in three chapters in section one, which is um, about introducing open dialogue and the approach. You can see at the top there that we had a, a forward um, written by uh, Danius Puras, who from 2014 to 2020 was the UN Special Reporter on the right to physical and mental health. Um, and he's he's written about um, a number of things um, about human rights and about the excessive use of, of medications in services. And he very kindly offered to write a foreword for us. And then I'm going to say more more now about the three sort of chapters to introduce the approach, which is a, a sort of a general chapter written by me, um, a chapter on the history written by Birgitta Alakari and Yako Sekola, and a a chapter particularly focused on, on, on psychosis. I'm going to say a little bit more about those now. So the first chapter broadly introduces the approach, um, the seven principles uh, and other sort of key aspects of, of, of the approach and the practice. And originally it didn't contain an illustration of the approach in practice, but at the request of Brian, my co-editor, I ended up writing a fictional account of a dialogical process based on my experience in order to bring the principles to life more, uh, to bring to make it more alive and, and, and less dry, perhaps. As I mentioned, chapter two um, provides an account of the historical development of the approach in Lapland and was written by Bogita Alakari, who sadly passed away recently as in, in collaboration with Jakob Sekula. And I'm very grateful to Bagita for working with me on the book through her illness. She continued to be very supportive of this project. 
Given that the book is part of the ISPS book series, the emphasis is on working with people having psychotic experiences and their families. And yet there's also a recognition through the book that open dialogue is not an approach specifically focused on a particular uh, diagnosis or diagnostic group. And in fact, a diagno focus on diagnosis uh, may be unnecessary and even unhelpful. So this was a sort of attention we were working on. It's part of a book series, but we, we you know, we don't necessarily want to be very focused um, on diagnosis. But Jakob Sekula's chapter in particular looks at different ways in which psychotic experiences may be understood in the open dialogue approach and shares some very helpful guidelines uh, for dialogues with people having psychotic experiences and, the, and their, net, their network. So that's section one. Moving on to section two. So this is um, uh, accounts of, of, of the practice of the experience of being in network meetings. And we have seven different accounts um, from the USA, the UK, Germany, Italy, and Norway. Just let you look at that for a moment. So five of the seven accounts of these dialogical processes in network meetings were co-written by network members, four chapters being co-written with the person having psychotic experiences and three co-written with a family member. And I'm, you know, I'm really pleased that this is the case. If I was to imagine um, writing a chapter for this section, I think now having practiced in this sort of collaborative way for, for a number of years, I can only imagine it, imagine writing um, something so in collaboration with the network. And in fact, I did invite one of the networks that, that, that I'm working with, with a colleague, if they would like to. And the, at one stage, it looked like that, that might be a possibility, but in the end, they de declined the invitation. And so um, it didn't come to pass, but I, you know, it, at some point, if, if I find myself doing that, I would, yeah, only want to write it together with the network. So the accounts in this section emphasize the value of the approach in different circumstances at the time of crisis, but also at later stages, including for people with very long term challenges. So people, the process started at quite different parts in people's journeys in these different accounts. But the themes that run through the chapters are the possibility of finding meaning in people's experiences, the feeling of safety afforded by the process, and the need for practitioners to be flexible in their work in order to maintain connections with everyone involved. Another central theme is the centrality of relationships in the open dialogue approach and the added value of including significant members of someone's network, both for furthering possibilities for meaning making and for addressing issues in relationships. Such there can be a significant improvement in relations over the course of the process. So that's section two. Section three is, about, is focuses on training. And I wrote an introductory chapter on training, which is based on my experience of participating in and being on a trainer on several different training programs. And then following this, a variety of trainers wrote chapters about their experience of running different training programs. And some participants on the programs have written reflections on their experience of participation. So I think there's there's probably five different kinds of trainings represented through the section as a whole. Now, one key sort of question in terms of our, our thinking about about the training um, and that we sort of write about in the editor's introduction is that we recognize that open di dialogue training programs are now being organized in many different countries, as I'm sure many of you are aware. 
And in Western Lapland, the three or four year training is considered to be core training. Um, but in other settings, a one year foundation training has been the full extent of training on offer. And so um, this naturally raises a question about the relative benefit of shorter and longer training programs. I suppose also the, re the realism of the settings that, that, that we're, we're trying to develop and, and what's feasible in terms of training. But what are the what's the impact of these different kinds of trainings on in terms of service and uh, practice and, and service development? Then a, a, another related point is that in Western Lapland, everyone has access to dialogical training, but in most other settings, it's only been possible to train a proportion of the staff team, which then raises issues about teamwork across the service, the dynamic in teams, and also the continuity in the approach and the resources available with continuity being one of the seven principles. Another point is that if we're looking to train entire teams, there will inevitably be some variation in the appetite for practicing dialogically. Um, most people re have reported favorably about having the opportunity to practice in this way, but in my experience, there is a variation in appetite. And also there can be resistance from more experienced practitioners trained in different approaches. And, and to what extent can we include everyone? It seems important to, to try if we're really gonna try to develop this approach more comprehensively. And finally, where training programs are organized, there needs to be a viable plan for service development with support from management. Otherwise, there is a danger of participants having limited opportunities to practice. And I've definitely been in this situation where there's been an investment in training, but there hasn't been enough thought given to the longer term sort of uh, service development and the, you know, the way in which people need to be supported to develop that practice. And that can be disappointing, of course. So that's section three on training. Section four um, is a variety of accounts of the process of developing the open dialogue approach in Germany, Italy, the UK, the USA, Sweden, S Switzerland, and Norway. As you can see there, there's a number of different um, settings. So in terms of this section, these are some sort of um, key points that, that, that come across in what's been written. Firstly, just a general point that I think this section in particular will be uh, of interest to people looking to develop their services in order to be able to practice open dialogue. Um, because there's, there's a lot of information in this section about the challenges that have been encountered and the possibilities that have, that have been realised. In some contexts, the main impetus for change has come from the grassroots. But in others, there's been more top down support. So these developments have happened in quite different ways. And ultimately, I think both are needed for sustainable service development. It's important also to build on aspects of existing practices that are in line with the approach. I think the sustainability in terms of when I think about the grassroots, I think about the sustainability in some of the accounts. It's clear that that that, that professionals are going above and beyond their usual levels of work because of their passion for this approach. And I think in the long term, this becomes less sustainable without that sort of top down support. A number of chapters in this section focus on a lack of resources available to develop services in order to meet all of the seven principles of open dialogue. And it's been necessary to make certain adaptations in some settings. One example would be the use of larger teams to work with a specific network with any two team mem two members of the team attending a specific network meeting. So the idea there would be that at least one person from the previous meeting would, would, would join the next meeting and thus ensuring some continuity. But of course, this is this is less continuity than is usual in the approach where it's the same two or perhaps three team members who, who, who meet every time. And finally, the section contains a chapter on the inclusion of peer workers in open dialogue. 
something which is being developed successfully in different ways in different services. And we've got um, three people talking about those developments in, in, in different services in that, in that chapter. So that's section four. Moving on to section five. So section five is about um, uh, open, well, it's called opening the dialogue with other approaches. So it's looking at kind of different related approaches, ways in which um, uh, people have, have worked with people having psychotic experiences and, and, and what similarities and differences do we find. So I would say that most of these contributions highlight similarities um, between open dialogue and, and other approaches, such as contemporary systemic family therapy in, a more di in its more dialogical form, uh, CBT for psychosis, um, as it's sort of included um, a more sort of mindful, compassion-based focus and a relational, more relational focus, interfamily therapy, um, where um, approach developed in Spain where, where they're working with, with many families at the same time, um, but inspired by open dialogue, therapeutic communities and music therapy, but of course also drawing distinctions between these different approaches. For me, it's important to recognise that there are many ways of responding in a need adapted service if we're truly looking to develop need adapted services. And so the provision of a variety of forms of response is likely to be beneficial as long as these are contained within a dialogical frame. And so I think this is the answer to the questions to one of the questions in service development, and, uh, which is around the resistance to developing this approach. If it's the fact that many existing approaches can still be valued within an open dialogue service, then we then there's a bridge that can be built. The question as to whether this dialogical frame can be maintained in a largely neurobiological service is sensitively explored by Sandy Steingard in the opening chapter. This is, of course, a crucial question in terms of the this being the kind of dominant model uh, in, 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 in most services. And then finally, Brian Martindale writes a chapter on psychoanalysis and open dialogue, reminding us of the psychoanalytic roots of the need adapted approach and the historical provision of psychoanalytic training in the service in Western Lapland. He outlines aspects of psychoanalytic practice, which he thinks both resonate with and augment or could augment dialogical practice. So that's section five. Moving on to the final section. Section six is all about research and it's uh, got the most number of con contributions, so I couldn't fit them all um, on one in, in one column. You can have a quick look at those now before I go into a little more detail. So the research from Western Lapland has been widely published and what we decided to do was just summarize this succinctly and, and, and Brian has done that, both the research from Western Lapland, but also the need research into the need adapted approach. And then, as you saw, there was a variety of other contributions to the section um, and these describe research into the feasibility of developing the approach in existing services and largely emphasize the possibility of doing so. So where, where people have looked at feasibility, it seems that, that, that they've, um, you know, they've seen the possibilities. 
but with certain adaptations being necessary according to context, at least initially. And of course, some of these research projects are on are ongoing. We're going to, be able to learn more in the in the years to come. Um, we've been hearing uh, you know a lot about ongoing research projects during this conference. The scope of the research described in this section ranges from a large scale trial to qualitative research on practice and process in network meetings. And you know we really emphasize that there is great value in different forms of research. But it's also important to acknowledge the limitations of research to date and um, some of the criticisms that have been um, you know, have been shared about the existing research and, and the need for further studies. Just focusing in, in, more into one particular aspect of the research, and this is looking about at the experience of network members uh, and um, the these emphasize you know, there seems to be themes that run through the feedback that, that comes from network members. And, and this is often sort of, I suppose it's, it's research that can be done relatively easily at an early stage in the development of a service um, to, to do surveys of, of, of network members and their experiences. And what's come back is an emphasis that they emphasize their appreciation of being listened to, collaborative decision-making, the experience of mutual support and understanding, the relationship that develops with staff, a safe space to say the otherwise unsayable, and the opportunity to make meaning of, of psychotic experiences in human terms. These, these are some central themes that, that have come back. There's also some information in some of the chapters about feedback from staff who've been able to practice the approach, which is also largely positive, and I don't have time to go into that now. Okay, so that's section six, the final section of the book. So, um, just to to let you know that that um, I think throughout the process we've had an idea that it would be good to 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 link the book to. A compendium of services that are being developed in, in, internationally. I, I, I get emails every week from people in different parts of the world saying, you know, is there something available near to us? What's happening in our country? And I think it would be great if collectively we could build um, a, a compendium that, that helps people to, 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 to see what's happening where. And of course, this, this, I very much hope this can link to the hope and dialogue survey um, as well and started to have some conversations with Rafaela about that. And there's a, a link there where services can register and add details of their service and, 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 and what they're developing. And if you'd like to get involved in the developments and maintenance compendium, I'd really like it to be a collaborative effort and please do get in touch um, to let me know. And the idea is that this, that Whatever um, services we have details of, we will be launching this at the same time as the book at the end of July. Hopefully we'll have a few more green dots than that. And then just to finish, just to let you know that there are some events um, lined up for the launch of the book. Um, the official online, this is kind of a rehearsal for the online book launch. The official online book launch will take place on the 13th of July. And will be chaired by Ludi Van Bell uh, from the ISPS. She's currently chair of the ISPS. Um, and there will be presentations by myself and, and Brian and a question and answer session. That's an online event. And then the book itself is published on the 30th of July. Um, and there's a discount code that you can use if you'd like to order it. Then we thought it would be good to plan an online conference. And so we're having a, a, a it's two half days, um, hopefully at a time that's convenient to most people who'd like to attend. And we're gonna have keynote presentations and workshops led by contributors to the book. Some of that information is already available in terms of what's gonna happen at the conference um, on a new website that, that, that has been built for the book. And there's an email address associated for that for anyone who'd like to get in touch. And it just remains for me to say thank you. Thank you for listening, but also thank you 
to everyone who's contributed to this book. It's been a, um, it's been a huge effort and, and many people have been very patient as we've gradually put it together. So um, yeah, I'm very grateful to have had this opportunity with, with everyone that's contributed. And that's all I have to say. I guess not. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Um, the, uh, I just want to say uh, now we know why it took four years <laughs> and, and, and why it was such a huge amount of work you, you put on your shoulders together with Brian. And there are no questions, but I just start uh, with one. What, what did you learn most? Why was it so important for you besides having a product which is of huge value? What did I learn most? Mm -hmm. Personally, what, why, what gave you the book? What might be interesting for other people? To, in, um, in terms of the, the process of putting the book together or in terms oh, of the approach? I just thought when, when a reader takes this book and, and you, ha you had been one of the first ones to do it, uh, so what, what did you get out of it? Ah, <laughs> uh, it was, what do I get out of it? And what does it take out of me? There's two, <laughs> there's two, there's two parts. Um, um, what do I get out of it? I, I, I think um, my, my spirit and my hope um, uh, uh, is, or what I enjoy is, is, is people coming together. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, you you uh, you mentioned my, me being a DJ, so that, that my you know my sound system is called Harambe Sounds, which is a Swahili word, and it means coming together. Mm -hmm. It means coming together to organise, but it also means coming together to to celebrate. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it was about it comes from a the word comes from an island on the east coast of Kenya, where they had to get the community together in order to push the boats into the sea. Mm -hmm. And and um, uh, that's a Harambe. And that word, when I visited Kenya 25 years ago, it was probably now that word really resonated with me. And I think it speaks to an aspect of my 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 spirit. And I think um, so. That's the main thing, you know, is, is the collaboration and the bringing in of many voices. And that's why I love the approach generally. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just as passionate about meeting with networks as I was when I first started. And I don't expect that to change. Um, so, yeah, I mean, at times it's been a lot of solitary work, kind of getting it, getting things going and not only the book, but getting trainings going, but, but, but the more opportunity I have for collaboration, the more, the happier mm. I am. When I listened, I thought uh, celebration was one of the other words you used. So the book is kind of a celebration and by, by just sawing all the uh, chapters, it's, it's a huge amount of wisdom and knowledge and, and practice right now we didn't know before the book was there and and the kenya is they push the boat into the ocean together so it's <laughs> that's what we do we constantly push the boat into the ocean to to arrive somewhere yeah and we and need to support each other in that yeah. and um but it was very it was very moving to me as i a couple of the, the sections where i just actually took the time when I was pausing just to look up the names of all the people, many of whom I know, mm -hmm. and to, to know about all, you know, to, 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 to be able to appreciate them and, and remembering all the conversations that I've had with them in the international meetings over the years. And now they're all here in a book. Yeah. Um, yeah. Quite moved by that. And, and um, yeah, feeling, feeling, feeling happier by the moment. To be the DJ of that. <laughs> I always look to the right, but no one is writing something, and I uh, I just wanted to start, but not to to be the only one. Can mm -hmm. we can maybe just open there, um, uh, or can uh, actually oh, actually Volkmar, yeah. open the the um, Chris Garden wrote congratulations on the magnificent ac accomplishment, just in the is in the Q and A. Yeah, that's yeah. certainly very important to say. We had another one where uh, Carol, Carol, or the other host could open the uh, micros so that people can talk and not write, maybe sp more spontaneously. Um, I don't think. I don't yeah. think so. Mm -hmm. You can. 
Uh, yes, I can, but uh, the, the point is I should make uh, all panelists and it's going to be a little bit chaotic, but if someone maybe, wants to... Maybe you can stop the recording, Carol, so... Yes, yes. Before doing this, okay, so we can use we the recording. Actually, we are uh, 47 people. I'm I'm afraid that we are, we are many to make guess... all them pa panelists. I guess those who don't speak should mute their micro, but the ones who want to talk, just open it. Okay, we are going to try if something happened, like uh, like technical uh, problems, I will uh, make them attendees again. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Forty six panelists. Silence. <laughs> Still. Just uh, also, I would like to ask all the panelists now not to turn on the cameras, please. Just the microphone if they want to ask some questions. Maybe everything was clear. Oh yeah, it was quite clear. <laughs> Might have raised more interest. Mm. Mm-hmm. 